nadejszła wiekopomna chwila, w której w podcaście Gutral Gada po raz pierwszy pojawi się masterclass. I ja nie wiedziałam nagrywając ten podcast, że to będzie masterclass. Ale rozmowa z moim dzisiejszym gościem wprawiła mnie w pewnego rodzaju zachwyt, podziw, uniesienie, czułość, tkliwość i zrobiła mi tak, nie wiem jak to nazwać, tak żeby to było, żeby oddawało to, co tam się wydarzyło. Zrobiła tak przyjemnie na sercu. Więc zdecydowałam się nazwać tę rozmowę masterclassem, bo rozmawiamy ze światowej sławy psychologiem, badaczem, profesorem Stevenem Hayesem. A rozmawiamy, bo w Polsce ukazała się właśnie jego najnowsza książka, którą redagował wraz z profesorem Stefanem Hoffmanem, Ponad DSM, Beyond DSM. Przywiązujemy dużą wagę do diagnoz. Często pacjenci zastanawiają się, co mi dolega, jak to się nazywa, jak to klasyfikować. A profesor mówi, zostawmy diagnozę, skupmy się na tym, co się dzieje. I jest to podejście nowatorskie, ale ważne, potrzebne i zmieniające poniekąd oblicze psychoterapii, podejścia samych w sobie klinicystów do swojego zawodu i wykonywanej pracy, ale przede wszystkim, które ma służyć dobru pacjenta. Proszę Państwa, z olbrzymią nieśmiałością, z olbrzymią wdzięcznością i zachwytem zapraszam Was do wysłuchania tego oto masterclassu, który jest nie tylko olbrzymią dawką wiedzy, ale moim zdaniem przede wszystkim mądrości, i doświadczenia. A za możliwość zrealizowania nagrania tego spotkania dziękuję Gdańskiemu Wydawnictwu Psychologicznemu, które wydało w Polsce książkę Ponad DSM, Beyond DSM. Ja nazywam się Joanna Gutral, jestem psycholożką i psychoterapeutką, a to jest podcast Gutral Gada. Dziękuję również wszystkim matronom i patronom, którzy trzymają za mnie kciuki i sypią grosz do patronowej sakwy po to, abym mogła robić to, co naprawdę lubię. Dziękuję i zapraszam do słuchania. Profesor Stephen Hayes, thank you for joining me and I'm so excited to talk to you the second time in my life. I'm a little bit nervous, I must say, because I, when I was a student, I was learning from your books. And you know how it is to have this student outer relationship when you cannot, you don't really see a person, you see the name and you know that everyone is recommending this book. So this person must be very smart. And now I'm just sitting and talking here to you and it, it makes me super nervous, but I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah, well, I, I have been in that position Less common now, but uh, even today, if I talk to my mentor, who's retired long since, I had that feeling. So, uh, yeah, I think it's so you know something what I we feel. all share. It's something we all share. All right. We meet to talk about your book that now is published in Poland by Gdańskie Wydawnictwo Psychologiczne called Beyond the SM, Toward a Process-Based Alternative for Diagnosis and Mental Health Treatment. Uh, You edited it, you wrote this book with Professor Stefan Hoffman. Uh, a lot of specialists and patients are really excited about this book, including myself. But what I see from the observations that pati- from patients that I am seeing in my office is a lot of people are really attached to their diagnosis. So they are coming to the office saying like, oh, I've been diagnosed with this and this and this, or please tell me what is my diagnosis, like what what I am facing, what I'm struggling with. And sometimes I don't know after the first session. Yes. Uh, sometimes I don't know after a couple sessions. Um, and sometimes there is not really a diagnosis. There is a problem, but they don't meet criteria that I can recognize and say like, oh, you have a major depression episode. Yes. And sometimes they are disappointed. But the, the, the question that I am curious the most is like, Why do you want to know so badly? Yes. So what pros and cons of being attached to diagnosis you perceive? Well, this is a long uh, story, and I think it it goes back a long time because understanding coherence, knowing why. I mean, have have you ever had children? I mean, young children say, why? Why, mommy? Why? And, you know, we are the whying creatures. 
and we want an answer. But when we're suffering, when we're struggling, we want an answer that empowers us, that sort of tells us what to do. And the diagnostic approach is the idea is that we will know what to do when we know what normative category we fit in. But that is very recent. That only started 150 years ago. I don't know about Polish, but in English, the word normal wasn't ever used in English until the Civil War, that's 1860s, became very big as uh, the psychology of individual differences caught on Galton or bell curves, where am I? You know, now today, you know, third graders will say what their percentile rank is on achievement tests. I mean, not only normal, but where you are as if that predicts your future. Well, it turns out it doesn't. It doesn't. What predicts your future are the things that you do, positive and negative. And so instead of having categories that fit the individual and empower them, we have categories that answer the why question, that invite you into fitting into a normative category, even if it's an ill-fitting suit. Can I give you an example from a diagnostic category? Yeah, sure. All right. Well, let's take major depression. Most people have heard this term, oh, I have major depression. One of the largest studies ever done on this category, or supposed category, I have to say it that way because of where it ended up, was called the STAR-D trial. It was a large multi-site trial, huge, something that will never happen again because in the U.S. and the major academic medical centers around the world no longer want to fund studies like this for reasons that we'll get into. But they had 3,700 and a few persons who are struggling and supposedly have this category. Okay, how many different collections of signs and symptoms did these people have? For folks who are not technical, uh, you know, the symptoms, uh, you know, uh, things that you complain of, signs that things that people can see uh, that you may not be complaining of. And there's only a small set, really, it's not huge, that define, but it's pretty medium length, that defines major depression. 3,700 people, how many different combinations of that small set were there in 3,700 people? And the answer is more than 1,000. Okay, well, how many people had a combination that was so atypical, so strange, so idiosyncratic, that it only applied to one one hundredth of a percent, about a little more, but of, in other words, about four to five other people in 3,700 were the same as you, almost half. So when you go in and you say, oh, I have this thing, it would sort of be like going in with a category in physical health, it was sort of like, oh, I have a malaise. Oh, I'm distressed. You know, it is so vague and ill-fitting. It doesn't tell you what to do as a person. It doesn't tell you what to do as a practitioner. And yet, this is what you spend so much time diagnosing. What difference does it make in treatment? Let's just say that. Just ask that question. And the answer, read the DSM. It says, this is not designed to help you pick the most successful treatment. So far as we know, it's not yet helpful in doing that. So let's talk maybe, if we want to go beyond DSM, let's focus on yes. DSM first. What is it? Why was it made? And what it was supposed to be doing? Well, that's a great question. Because academic psychiatry, which is where the DSM or the ICD, so the same basic theme, you know, the issue of why do we have mental health struggles is a natural extension of what your three-year-old would ask. You know, it's what we all want to understand when we're suffering. Why? Why? If I understood why, maybe I'd know what to do about it. Yeah. And in medicine, uh, we know why when we know where did it come from functionally. How does it evolve over time and develop? And what are the processes that lead to that? And how can we change those processes such that we get good outcomes? You know, what, how does it respond to treatment and why? If we know these three things, technical terms, etiology, 
course responds to treatment. Well, then we have a thing that's called a disease. And medicine has done an amazingly good job about understanding diseases. They're reaching the limits often in particular areas that, that is very relevant to this question. But academic psychiatry wanted to be like the rest of medicine. Why? Now, sometimes you go to the doctor and you say, oh, I have a skin rash. Oh, what is this? And they say, oh, you have uh, idiopathic dermatitis. Yeah, which is just the word for you got a rash and I don't know where it came from. You know, but people go leave the doctor's office saying, oh, I have idiopathic dermatitis. I thought I just had a rash and I didn't know where it came from. Dude, it means the same thing. It's the exact same thing. Now, but if you had a diagnosis that was adequate, you'd say, oh, you have a rash from an allergic reaction to this particular skin cream that you're putting on. And other people wouldn't have that, but you do because you have an allergic reaction to the ingredient. That would be one reason. There could be a hundred different reasons. That'd be okay. But then you'd know what to do. Don't use that cream. Use another cream, for example. Or, you know, uh, don't scratch yourself constantly or don't allow that uh, fungus to grow. Let's see if we can treat that. Or you, you, you see where I'm going. Well, in psychiatry and psychology, we have almost nothing about that. So what we did was another strategy that's in medicine. It's in health, which is when you don't know why, carefully document the what and hope that that takes you to the why. Not just in medicine, but it's in all of science. I mean, take, I'll take an example because you'll see why. When we didn't know where plants actually came from in terms of genes and so forth, we would do things as human beings and categorizing plants by looking at things like how many petals on the flower are there? What color is it? What stages of growth does it go through? And you, that's called botanizing because in early botany, study of plants, they didn't know why, but they went to what, right? Soon enough, they realized, oh, my goodness, I can't do that because you'd get deceived. Oh, these are the blue five petals. These are the blue five petals. But now that we know about genes, we know that they're really not the same flower. Or you'd say, oh, these are really different flowers, such as uh, toad flax, a, a little flower, a flower that has two forms. One is, is, is uh, called uh, pyloric, I mean, monstrous toad flax. And it turns out the genes are identical, but it has epigenes. It has these things that control gene expression that produce completely different flowers. It's the same plant, genetically, identical. So when we got into the why, we come surprising answers. Things that look the same are different. Things that look different are the same. What do we have like that in psychiatry? We don't have that. We don't know why people suffer. So we are still in the level of the pink petals and the blue petals and the five petals and the four petals. What are they? Signs and symptoms. And what are the categories? Syndromes. How has that worked out? After 50 years and many, many, many billions of dollars around the world. Well, we've socialized all of the culture to say, I have this and I have that. And the outcomes are not getting better. They're getting worse. Our suicide rates are up. Our depression rates are up. Our anxiety. And we don't know why. Because it turns out there are a few places in medicine. I'll finish this. I know. But where that way of getting to why never worked. Let me give you an example. Cancer. If you go to a physician and you have cancer, they can answer some why questions that will make a difference as to whether or not you live or die. They even have very personalized ones now, which we'll get into. But how did they get there? When did the cancer rates really start dropping? When they stopped doing things like only, oh, you have a, a red splotch on your head and it's shaped like this. And over here, the person has a different color splotch and it's shaped like that, botanizing cancer. It was a little bit of a help early on and then it 
it stopped. We still don't know why. And we didn't know, are these two things the same? Or are they different? They look different, but they could be the same. Or are these two things that look the same actually different? Nowadays, you go to a physician, they know some of the underlying processes all the way down to the oncogenes that are leading to unrestricted cell growth, what we call cancer, and even some of the epigenetic things that are controlling gene expression. So here's the problem, is that we're not answering the why questions. It's 40, 50 years into it. And people are fed up enough already. I graduated psychology, like, I don't know, five, six years ago. I don't remember. And I remember learning almost by heart the diagnosis criteria from ICD and DSM. And I felt like this is the most important thing I need to learn. Yes. And then when I started working as a psychotherapist a couple of years later, I was like, I don't really know what to do with that knowledge. And when I was doing my psychoeducational work at social media, I realized that people are striving to find the diagnosis to answer what's happening to me. And then they got so close identify with it yes. that it was kind of used as a, you know, something that is the core of their identity, exactly. which I find very difficult to treat because when it's the part of your identity, do you really want to get rid of it? Yeah. And, and part of that identity may include things that are actually not in the diagnosis because it's not really answering the why question. It's just describing the what, which if you were very careful, you could probably describe your what uh, better than the categories for all the reasons I was just saying. There may be, you know, your very individual kind of form of what we'd call depression, etc. But inside of this is connotation that you have something. And inside that, because it comes from the healthcare system, that you got it due to your nature. And inside that is sometimes, well, then I need medications. So we've seen a massive rise of medications. In the UK last year, one out of three teenagers were on antidepressants. In the United States this year, one out of four women are on antidepressants. These are chemicals that can produce lifelong adjustments in how you handle serotonin. They can permanently change your nervous system. And there's a recent meta-analysis saying there's no indication whatsoever that you had disturbed serotonin as a for as the pathway as the why question to getting depression none it's got we've spent so much time discovering we know it's wrong so we know that antidepressants for example change how serotonin is handled and it can have some benefits but it has a lot of side effects sexual side effects etc but part of it also is that it starts have impacting your nervous system in ways that sometimes lead to really major changes in how these neuro transmitters, you know, the chemicals involved in your nervous system operate. So in the attempt to get to the why question, we've in put into the culture this little connotation that mental suffering is something that you have, that it's actually a latent hidden disease. Well, look, if it was a disease, then we would have syndromes, descriptions of signs and symptoms, turning into diseases. How many times has that happened in the history of academic psychiatry and psychology since the DSM effort started? The answer is none. Zero. Not one. Not autism. Not schizophrenia. Not even the ones that you'd say, oh, surely. I'm not saying they don't have a biological basis. Our conversation right now has a biological basis. But that doesn't mean that it's... And, and don't believe me believe the American Psychological uh, Psychiatric Association, the creator of the DSM, that in the DSM-5 work group said, there are no examples of syndromes turning into diseases. That's why they said we have to do something different. And when the DSM-5 came out, everybody yawned or giggled because it wasn't really different. So how long are we going to go down this pathway with what you say? Absolutely. People create it as an identity use it to explain their life, doesn't give them an answer to the why question that empowers. It looks destigmatizing, but it's also horizon shortening. What do you expect of me? I have a brain disorder. 
Where's the evidence you have a brain disorder? Well, I have this diagnosis. Uh, dude, read the fine print. It didn't, it said, you may have a brain disorder. Yeah, well, you, I may have a brain, I mean, the, I may have monkeys flying out of my ear. You can say anything, may have, but you can't say is scientifically unless you have the evidence. You don't have any evidence that major depression is a brain disorder or any other. We don't know why. That's, and I don't want to beat up just on brain interpretations. I'm fine with that. So we, we've created a mess for ourselves culturally and scientifically and practically. Well, I think that besides what we have and how we can classify, the biggest question is what you're going to do about it. Exactly. And I heard a long time ago the sentence that really stick to me at my work life. The diagnosis describes a set of symptoms, not a human being. Yeah. So when I am sharing this sentence with my patient, uh, I am just wondering what, from your perspective, if you are going beyond the DSM, yes. what should be the main focus in the process of change in psychotherapy treatments? What we should do is we should look at what are all the things that, the major things, because we can't do everything, that people do functionally, you know, answering the why questions, the things that you do that have a little why piece to it, you know, like I drank a beer, why? To have fun with my friends, that's one thing. So that I wouldn't feel so anxious, that's another thing. Same action, drinking a beer, different purposes. There's a way of talking about these little functional or for a purpose steps that people take, including at biological level and so forth. But let's talk about the ones that are obviously in your control as psychological actions. We call them processes of change. The things you do. A process just means a procession, a sequence, the things you do in a sequence to try to change something for some larger purpose. All right, well, we've spent one of the side effects of all these years in the wilderness of trying to make the DSM work is we have learned quite a number of processes of change, of the sequences of things that people do that lead to positive and negative outcomes and how therapy changes those sequences. So my colleagues and I, since this book, but it's an expression of where we were going with this book, Stefan Hoffman, myself, the two editors, but also Joe Sorochi, who's a psychologist at Australian Catholic University and a positive psychology expert, where we looked at every single randomized ever trial ever done in the history of the world that claimed to answer the why question around why did treatment work, psychosocial treatment. We didn't do medications. We just published it. It took us three years. A staff of 50 looked at 55,000 studies. And we found uh, 73 measures that were replicated in a total of 281 successfully done studies. And here's the deal. Half of what we know about why is that you learn, need to learn to be more psychologically flexible or mindful. Other things that would be important, you need to be more flexible in your cognition. Don't get wrapped around it. You need to learn healthy reappraisal skills. You need to have good, good self-efficacy, meaning that when you see something that's important, you have to have that sense of, okay, I'm going to mobilize and get it done. You need to be able to take care of diet, sleep, and exercise. You need to manage your relationships and have you know, positive uh, connections in your life. Well, these are all things you can learn. There's a few others, but these are all things you can learn and things that you can do. So here's what the alternative is. What if we took, the instead of biomedicalizing human suffering, we take what are the areas that are really hard for you in terms of outcomes? Let's say I'm really distressed about sadness. I'm really distressed about anxiety. I'm feeling lonely and disconnected. Life satisfaction. Life has no meaning for me. Things like that. And then we ask the question, within your life over time, not in comparison to everybody else, but you, what are the things you do that move you in a positive or a negative direction with regard to that? We can do that and we can model that. 
And let me, let me give an example from depression. Sure. All right. Here's an individual human being who has high levels of distress over sadness. I'm not going to say who is depressed. Because once I say that, I'm in these top-down normative categories, these cubby holes that we shove human lives into. As you say, the syndrome is not the person. And as I said earlier, you can be sharing it with one one hundredth of a percent of everybody else shoved in that cubby hole. So they're, let's not assume everybody in that cubby hole is the same person. They're not. They have the same words put atop their head. But, okay, so this particular person does this. How do I know it? We measured them repeatedly for a month. And we modeled statistically what led to what in their life, not someone else's life. It's a little hard to do. The statistics are weird. You don't need to know that. But if you're being... Oh, give me more. I love multi-level modeling. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm nerdy. Let's keep it. Let's yeah, but it, 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 really, it goes beyond multi-level modeling because of a reason I'll... Uh, dramatically because of a reason I'll describe. But that's a step in the direction. It's a step in the direction. But, okay, so here's what happened to this person. When they get distressed by sadness, they withdraw from people. When they withdraw from people, they have a sense that they have no challenges in their life, nothing of importance. When they have a feeling that there's nothing of importance to do, they space out and become mindful, mindless, and they have a sense that they're really not fully in touch with the world outside or in. They're kind of in a spacey fog. Where When they're in that space, they become distressed over sadness. It's a self-amplifying loop. These processes, what are they? Well, I don't know. Let's look at function. The social withdrawal that you do when you're sometimes feeling really sad. My guess is that's probably you're trying to manage your emotions. Yeah. The lack of challenges. You know, my guess is you're losing contact with your values and what's really important. Spacing out. My guess is you don't have good mindfulness skills. You don't know how to come into the present in a full way. You disappear into the past and future. Then more sadness? Well, that's understood. I mean, if you're really kind of wandering around, hardly knowing where you are, feeling disconnected, it's not important, I'm all alone because of all the things that came earlier, sadness would be a pretty natural emotion, wouldn't it? I think it were. It's just, and why are you distressed? Because it's self-amplifying. You don't know how to break the pattern. You don't even recognize the pattern. And the healthcare system doesn't help you because it says, oh, here's the pattern. You have major depression. Uh, what should I do? And then the pill bottle starts shaking. And there's a big, big industry at one point four trillion dollar industry that's only too happy that that's where your mind goes well we have medical perspective of health that health is where there is no disease we have also a positive approach to health like exactly. health is not only the lack of disease but also the possibility to reach your potential and follow your values and then you don't necessarily need to have any sort of exactly and physical suffer. physical you know you would say do i have the strength do i have the endurance do i have the physical flexibility you know just if i was just talking physically if you go to the gym and they're talking about you know how to build they're going to talk that way how come when you go to the shrinks they don't well some do but they're fought It, it, almost like a ball and chain having to do this for what reason? Because the healthcare system demands it, the insurers want it, whatever. And then people hear these words and it sticks on them like a second skin. You know, this is a clown suit you have to crawl into. You know, I have this or I have that. You have patients coming to you that will, you know, say the first two sentences and they could contain three or four diagnoses. Why am I here? Ting, 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 ting. I have BPD and PTSD and, and an anxiety disorder, depression, and, 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 and I'm uh, you know, using substances. I mean, you can 
have you been in that in those moments when people come in with their multiple diagnoses that they've internalized? Oh yeah. And you have a sense like, oh my goodness. Where do I start and what am I supposed to do <laughs> exactly. with it? But if you had somebody come into you and said this, you know, I'm distressed over sadness and I've noticed a pattern. When I do that, I withdraw. When I withdraw, it doesn't have meaning. When it doesn't have meaning, I space out and then I feel even more sad. Can you help me? Boy, you'd say, I am sure I can help you. I can and teach I'm you mind skills. I can teach you social and relationship skills. I can work on we can work together on your values clarity and how to mo well could we create a diagnostic system that gave the clinician and the individual that level of information yeah that's what this book's about i don't want to talk about polish mental health uh, care system because i will need to use words which are highly inappropriate so we will talk about it behind the behind the scenes but um <laughs> some people so the mental health problems started being open conversation, I would say recently in Poland, yes. okay, to the point that people are not afraid of saying I am seeing psychiatrist or I am seeing psychotherapist. So I don't want anyone to think that we kind of trying to suggest that DSM is bullshit, because I don't think it would be totally fair to say that, or that we don't trust the creators of some sort of system that helps you to understand how the diseases works, even if the system is not perfect. But I would like to ask what exactly the Beyond DSM approach and your book is proposing instead? Yeah, we don't, you know, we don't have to, you know, A, we're not questioning the good hearts of the people who've created this. They're trying to get to what are the answering the why question. This was a strategy to get there. It just didn't move us very far down the road towards it. And inside, I mean, you could say something like, let me give you the example I was just gave. A person comes and says, I have made a uh, major depression. And you say, okay, well, that's the category. Now let's dig into what is actually happening here that is most distressing to you and look at what are the things you do, good, bad, and indifferent, that either help or hurt with regard to that. So, you know, if you if we simply... I could even live inside the DSM diagnostic system if it empowered people to really look at the why question in a way that really gave them answers. The academic psychiatry hopes that it'll give us categorical answers, but that's the 50 years that have been spent and nothing's turned into a disease. And what did cancer do when botanizing cancer didn't work? They went into the labs and they started studying things like oncogenes. Why does that matter? Because when you go to the physician now, they can do a cancer treatment that targets, for example, turning on and off the genes that lead to unrestricted cell growth. What else? Well, I asked permission for my brother to say this, but I'll, I'll give you an example. My brother has prostate cancer, and it's a pretty aggressive form. What, and he's a physician, retired now. What did he do when he got that diagnosis? He ran down to the University of California, San Francisco, to get an individual personalized medicine as to what exactly is going on with that tumor, to do really obscure tests the average person wouldn't know about. He knew about him because he's a physician. You know, and... Uh, he, he visited another uh, f famous uh, academic uh, medical center, and between the two, they could come up with a tailored, specific to his tumor and the way his body works, uh, cancer uh, treatment. And I'm happy to tell you, I don't know if it's because of that, but they've stopped the tumor in its tracks, and we're now a year whatever in, and it looks like maybe that's going to work. That's what you want from the healthcare system. That's what people want from psychologists and psychiatrists and clinical social workers. So could we do this? Could we take the categories and say, fine, okay, that's the category. Now what about you? And so if you're only one one hundredth of a percent, that doesn't mean that we need to turn you into an error term and just give you the same protocol that everybody else gets. No, I want to know in a more specific way, what are the things that help or hurt? And some of that will require new 
concepts that will require new measures and new statistics, but it's not beyond us now. And I mentioned to you this uh, huge project we did where we identified every one that had been identified so far. It's not such a long list. We can dive into how to foster these positive and inhibit, inhibit these negative processes of change that are in people's lives. And, um, but you're going to have to learn as a clinician how to think about that that way. And I think it, you have to learn as a uh, just an individual person how to do pattern recognition in your own life that has that sort of second m- mindset. Like you step back and watch and you keep asking the question of why did I just do that? Why did I just do that? So you go from just the form. I had a beer. I ate half a gallon of ice cream last night. I slept till 11, even the missing a meeting, you know, whatever it is. And you'll have that little, what was I doing there? What was that for? Why did I do that? And inside the good answers, when you get oriented towards what are actual common human processes of change, disappearing into the verbal network, for example, that's what you worry about, allowing it to become almost a self-identity. That was what you were talking about forgetting what your values are and never getting clear about them in the first place and on and on it goes. So that's the vision. And what it will lead to, I think is not what we're getting. What we're getting in the psychosocial side is protocol after protocol, after protocol, after protocol that no human being could learn all these different things. And by the way, they're pretty similar. What it's getting over the medication side is a few really key medications that are used for everything but that have side effects and have long-term opponent process effects. And so, yeah, that's the way I would describe it is we don't have to burn down the house, but we have to stop turning people into error terms. We have to stop fuzzing the individual. We have to adopt concepts and measures that help you see the individual and what they want. So, I'm I'm actually very happy that you brought up the protocols because I need to admit that as a young cognitive behavior therapist, that was the most stressful part to follow the protocol and make sure yeah. that everything is exactly how it was written in the protocol. Otherwise, I'm doing a bad job. So if there are any young cognitive behavior therapists listening to us right now, please leave a comment so we can create a group of support that <laughs> screwing up a protocol is not the biggest issue in your life. And we can went through because what we need, as I understood what you say, is more a tailor-made job instead of a mass manufactured uh, treatments that are not really applied in the right context when we treat an individuals. Exactly. The things we did when we pushed people into these diagnostic cover holes, we doubled down on that and pushed healthy steps forward into gigantic protocols and then started saying to clinicians, you are robots. You will do everything in the protocol or you have sinned. It's such nonsense. It's such, you know, and the clinicians hate it, of course, because you see the developing individual in front of you. And the protocols weren't analyzed that way. They were analyzed through bell curves and standard deviations. People were fuzzed into error terms. That's not the only way to do it. You can look individually within the person as to what happens. And when you do that, you see, oh, this lesson that's in my protocol, the purpose of that is to move these processes. This person is already great there. I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. This other one, eh, this person needs help there. I need to spend more time on that. So why wouldn't it be tailored? Why wouldn't it be so creative that if you understand the process, you can make things up in the session that will move that process right in front of you and fits with what we know. And it's not ever written in a book. It has showed up in, your, in the relationship and in your own creative mind as a clinician. How can that not be evidence-based if what we're moving are the processes that hurt or help people? And that's scientifically known. To me, you know, whatever gets the job done, if you know what the job is, 
is evidence-based. What is your job? Your job, dear clinician, is to move processes of change that will allow that life to evolve in a positive direction in the way that they choose and ask you for help with. Yes, we've been socialized into saying, oh, get rid of my syndrome. That's usually the first thing they'll say. Take away my pain. Take away my... But no, what they really want, dig down, is they want relationships that work. They want to be able to feel without being overwhelmed. They want to be able to show up into their lives, to learn and live and love and contribute. So can we help with that? Yes, we can. We have lots of tools in those protocols or evidence-based kernels, elements that will move things. What will they move? Well, maybe they'll move the diagnostic categories we still probably have to live in for another many decades until something else emerges. But at least we can be certain that they move the core processes of change that make a difference in human life. You, you brought up uh, the uh, example of the patient who is coming to the uh, office and giving the list of the diagnosis he already received yeah. from some previous clinicians. And uh, of course, it happens like a single diagnosis most of the time as a unicorn. But um, the trans-diagnostic processes are, I don't want to say becoming popular. I find them very useful at my job. Uh, in Poland, we have translated uh, the trans-diagnostic uh, protocol of the emotional problems treatment by Barlow and colleagues, which I find amazing for people from the group of mood disorders and anxiety disorders. It's do doing just amazing job. Why do you think it's, is it going to be the future? Is it a good path? What do you think about it? Well, I'm a student of Dave Barlow, who is my mentor on uh, internship, and we've written books together. And is a deep, deep into, uh, you know, a colleague and a, a good friend. Um, and I think the unified protocol is a very positive step forward. It needs to be matched by the diagnostic system itself stepping forward, and he's not taking that on. Uh, I think we can get so transdiagnostic that the word transdiagnostic no longer fully applies in the sense that we can become so individualized and personalized that it's really the diagnosis is uh, what are the constellations of processes that fit you. And that's a step beyond where, where Dave is right now. But I think, you know, because you said for mood and anxiety disorders, so there's one foot firmly planted in where we are and then one foot into tailoring and individualization. As you get into processes of change, as you, which are transdiagnostic, like, for example, well, let's just take the psychological flexibility concept, because that plus mindfulness accounts for 50% of all the mediational findings that have ever happened in the history of the world. That's the big meta or systematic review we just did. Well, what's inside psychological flexibility? Well, it's learning to be more emotionally open without clinging. To be able to think more flexibly without getting entangled in, in thought involuntarily. To be able to see your thoughts and make some choices about them. To be able to come into the present moment in a way that allows your attention to be narrowed or broadened, shifted or staying, without disappearing into rumination and worry, the conceptualized past or future, without even having a choice in the matter. To be able to connect with a sense of self that is more than the features you have, I'm this old, do I have this disorder and all that, but connects with this more purely aware, witnessing, noticing, conscious sense of self, the part that connects you in consciousness to others. When you looked at your loved one and they looked back at you and you were connected in that moment, it wasn't a major depressive disorder connecting with a borderline. That's not what happened. Two conscious human beings connected in that moment. You can feel it. You can see it. And when you empower that more spiritual part of us, then we're not going to do it in church. We've got to do it here because human beings need this dimension. And it gives us the flexibility to be able to open up to the hell of our own history with our difficult thoughts, feelings, memories, and so forth without disappearing into the past and get wrapped around the condition the cognitions or avoiding or clinging to the emotions. If you do all of that, that's called mindfulness. And if you do all of that, you're ready for the next big step, which is what do you really deeply care about? 
And how can you mobilize your life's moments and what you actually do to create habits of doing things that you deeply care about? Learning how to love, learning how to contribute, learning how to play, whatever it is, learning how to create, whatever it is you want to bring into your life and the world. You tell me what that is. Let's mobilize as to how to put it there. I mean, how many people have you met who are suffering inside depression, who are also really clear about their values and boy out there doing their values-based habits, just from contributing to others. And like, I can't think of a single person, not one. It's not that they don't have values, but it's set up in such a way of, Oh, I can't live my values. Oh, I'm suffering. You know, so and I'm not mocking the person by saying that I'm saying there's a kind of a, system that pulls people into pain instead of lifting them up out with their pains. And it, well, the, those six things that I said, the psychological flexibility and mindfulness, that's half of all the studies that have ever been done, not as act studies, all kinds of other studies. I'm known for acceptance and commitment therapy or act. Well, for people listening to me, what the so what is, the so what is, could we learn to look for when we're being open or closed emotionally, flexible or inflexible cognitively, in the present or disappearing, wrapped around our self-concept and what people are seeing and judging us about or connected to this deeper sense of self that is okay by your birthright, focused on what your values are or are just chasing money or likes on an Instagram page, committed action or procrastination, chaos, uh, avoidant persistence, slogging on, workaholism. You know, it, it's not that complicated. <laughs> you know, there's only so many ways to get screwed up. And frankly, thinking about it in terms of processes of change, yeah, there's 200 transdiagnostic processes. But if you really think of the core of what they're trying to do, uh, you can simplify it down to about six or seven things. And their inner relationships. And then look to the individual as to how that's played out for you. And that's a far simpler, but I think far more directly relevant kind of diagnosis. Well, probably for a long time, we're, what's we're going to happen is we'll still have the diagnoses. And then we'll have a functional analysis or something we'll call it. That is the individual pattern recognition for how your life has been playing in a way that's positive or negative and what we can do to empower a positive journey. And we know a lot. We know a lot about how to do that. Mark these words, people, and we will see in a couple of years what's going to happen and just We are absolutely going to see in a couple of years. And, you know, can I, can I share some brand new data just to show you something? Okay. I, I, okay. Come on, come on. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Okay, so one process that people might heard about is self-compassion, self-kindness, pretty close to emotional acceptance, pretty close to psychological flexibility concepts that I just talked about. Probably most people would assume if you are kind of just swimming in the, the self-help world or the current third wave CBT things or what's going on in psychology, you probably would assume that self-compassion is really a pretty good thing, and we've got to foster that. And And not only that, but when we do, We'll probably get better compassion towards others. People who are kind to themselves are probably kind towards others. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So they were, so we're doing the good for the world. We're going to help. You know, look at these wars and the immigration crisis, climate change, all that. If we were more kind to ourselves, we'll be able to really care about whether that island's going underwater or where those immigrants are escaping a war zone or whatever. Right. Okay, so here's what that we have, we did now. I'm waiting for we the looked, plot twist. All right. We looked at self compassion and other, compassion towards other within the person over time in a large data set, one at a time, not top down normative. They correlate at the level of the group about 0.35. Self compassion predicts compassion towards others. Now you look within the individual. If you get more self compassionate, do you start being kind to others within your life? That's a different question. You have to look at it over time individual by individual. And the answer is, for three out of five people, yes. For one out of five, it doesn't seem to be related. For one out of five, the kinder they get to themselves, the meaner they get to others. Dear clinicians, 
You need to know this. What is going on? Well, we know a little bit of what's going on. We've been diving in. There's a thing called selfish self-compassion. You've seen it in your friends, maybe even in your clients. You take care of the kids. I got to go meditate. You know, I know I missed the meeting, but I was self-soothing in a bubble bath. Excuse me? Uh, and Okay, maybe you missed the meeting deliberately, but what if that's creating chaos in other people's lives and you've made promises you haven't lived through? You, you see the problem? And guess what? The people who do that, self-compassion doesn't predict life satisfaction and quality of life. Those are the ones, and you've seen it, to say, oh, self-compassion doesn't solve anything. No, the problem is, is it's as a system within the individual, it's actually may actively even being harmful. But when you put it in a group thing, it becomes a fuzz, and you say, oh, it correlates 0.35. No, sometimes it correlates 0.7 within the individual. The kinder you are to yourself, the kinder. Sometimes it's minus 0.3 or 4. Now, oh, I don't, how would I do that? Well, we have to stop thinking that people are to be shoved into normative categories. We have to start doing what you, dear clinician, are already doing. You're noting patterns over time with your clients. That's what they are doing at their best within their own lifetimes. How come the measures and the concepts don't do that? How come they talk only about the normative categories and cubby holes? And so you're going to, we're on a journey, and I, you said, we'll see how it turns out. You know, I already know a bunch about how it turns out because I know the studies that are coming and the evidence that is there. And it's going to shock the world. It is absolutely going to shock the world because whatever you think these normative categories taught you, I can show you it's, up, it's an upside-down world. But a really important new world, like suddenly, you know, the – we're looking at the world with different eyes. We've literally in the last few weeks invented new statistical methods. You know, we're so much on the hunt here. You know, what would it mean if we chase processes individuals by individuals? So I'm really extremely excited. I have an app that's coming, which will be free, free for clinicians to use at a Yay. limited level that will allow you to actually do a case by case. Make sure to shoot me an email about it. I would be more than happy to announce Absolutely. it to the Polish audience. And we're spending the money to have it available in any language. You would not believe how much that costs. But And I hope we don't go bankrupt before the app, app comes out. This is not a commercial app. It's in a private nonprofit. Uh, so, and I take no money from it at all, zero. So I'm, I'm the president of the charitable organization, but I take no money from it. Um, so I know what's coming, and I can I have a little bit of credibility. You know, people maybe. They may have heard of me. They may have known that if I have any, I would say to those who are listening and maybe they're reading the book, you know, uh, in part based on that. If you take this seriously, you're on a journey that is going to be exciting, empowering and disorienting because we're going to have to stop thinking about one size fits all solutions. We're going to start have to start thinking about how to empower people. And that will stretch you, but you also be way, way more able to put your full creative professional sense into your the hours you have with the people that you serve. Not only data, but also life looks different from mean level perspective. And when we dive into within subject differences, it makes a difference. And the sentence you said about uh, being a part of a process that happens over time for the individual uh, will stay and stick with me uh, forever because that was uh, very bright and great and supportive. So thank you so much for this inspirational, amazing speech and conversation podcast we made. I would call it a masterclass. I don't care. Uh, it was wonderful. <laughs> and I hope to host you again as soon as possible and talk about the app and talk about the program you're doing guys because it sounds absolutely amazing thank you so much professor well thank you and i look forward to that day and i thank uh, those who are listening and i hope that uh, there's something in this book and what follows that empowers those that you serve Beyond the SM by Gdańskie Wydawnictwo Psychologiczne is out in Poland translated so guys go get your copy Thank you so much one more time. And, and we recorded that. You, you already said that you're looking forward for another meeting. So we got you. Thank you so much <laughs> and see you soon.
Peace, love, and life, my friend.